What's up, Empowered Christians? Pastor Brian with Empowered Christian Ministries, back again to continue with our Bible study. Today we're doing uh, chapter 1, subsection C, called God's Triune Nature. And so the question is this, do you need to believe in the Holy Trinity? That's the question we're going to dive in today. If you just want the quick version, the answer is yes. Yes, you do need to believe in the Holy Trinity. It's essential for a lot of reasons. We're going to get into it today. So, um, if you haven't already, click like, subscribe, and hit the notification button. Uh, also, uh, go to either our website, empowerchristian.org, slash T-E-C-R-M, or go to our Amazon direct link and get the book, or you can also go to any other ebook store using this link, um, and you can also go um, to Barnes & Noble and get the full color paperback version using this link. Um, so, all right, so let's jump right in. When we talk about God, what do we think about? Right, it's the nature of God is of utmost importance. It's not a matter of of inconsequence, right? It's this is essential. This is important. What you think about who God is changes what you think about who Jesus is and who or what the Holy Spirit is. So if we don't think of the triune God, the Holy Trinity, when we think of God, then it distorts and messes up everything else, right? This is why it's so important. Because if God is not triune, then Jesus becomes some other type of created being. He becomes a lesser God, a second God, a created being, an angel, something else. And that is wrong. That's heresy. So, and the same thing with the Holy Spirit. It becomes an impersonal, an impersonal force or another type of God or another type of created being, which is also wrong, also heresy. So, um, the, in the book, I list probably, let's see, about, you know, probably a dozen or so different scriptures. So I'm not going to go through and repeat all of them. You already have that. But um, I will list a few of them. The first is Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven after being resurrected and on the earth for 40 days. And he's giving the marching orders to all of the church. He's giving it to the apostles and everyone else that's there with them. And he says... Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, so this is, he's giving the marching orders. He says, go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is important. Jesus wants all of his followers to do this, okay? Um, baptizing in the name of Jesus alone is wrong. It's, it's too detailed to get into that right now. Um, I, I briefly mention it in, in the book, um, and I also have articles and other things. Let me, I'll find one and put it in the description. If you're curious about that, if your church baptizes in the name of Jesus and kind of my position on that and a biblical uh, walkthrough of that. But we should be baptizing in the triune formula and um, let me go through and also just quickly describe what the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is because a lot of people still get it wrong even though it's basically been set in stone for 1700 years, but Satan is always trying to distort this doctrine. So uh, notice first that Jesus wants us to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's, these aren't three separate beings, they're one. God is one, right? Um, there's only one God. This one God exists as one essence or substance 
in three persons, right? And I give the Greek words, it's one usha in three hypostases. So what this basically means is that God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost, are is their one absolute perfect divine being revealed to us in three persons, in three personal ways, right? Of that of, of relating there's these three personal ways that God is relating to the creation that he made. So it's it, essentially God is one in essence. He's one in his fullness of his nature. And then he has revealed himself in these three personal ways to everything that has been created. So he is God in relation to what he has created. Um, the three are called persons, not because the three separate beings, but merely for a lack of better word, um, because they relate to each other in a personal way, right? Within God's own essence, his own being, he, he relates within himself in these three separate ways. So I like to say that there is a clear distinction without a separation, right? There's not a, a separation between the Father, Son, and Spirit. They're not separate beings fighting over what happens and what, uh, and who's gonna get to be in charge and, and who's right and who's wrong. There's, they're one in perfect agreement, in perfect will, in perfect desire, um, in perfect uh, representation of one another but they are distinct. We can, we can relate to them separately. We can relate to the Father and the Son separately and the Holy Spirit separately. We can identify that there, there is a distinction between them by even having those names. And it's, it shows that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all God, but they are not the same as one another. So the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father and so on, but they're all God. They're all, they're all of the same essence that exists apart from the rest of creation. These three together are Yahweh, Jehovah, God Almighty, God Most High, okay? Now, all three, uh, God does not become the Father and then become the Son, and then become the Spirit. He doesn't take on different modes. This is called modalism. It's an ancient heresy. It creeps back up. It's still around now. Satan's always doing this. But he does not become one or the other. All three exist simultaneously. They exist at the same time. They are co-eternal and co-equal. Okay? The Son wasn't just... When Jesus was praying, he was praying to the Father. He, he wasn't, God didn't, he wasn't the father and then he went and became the son and took that mode on and then went back to being the father and then back to being the son and then back to being the father and then back to being the son. No, the son prayed to the father. They talked to one another. In fact, they've been doing that for all of eternity, right? They're both eternal. They're in absolute perfect agreement. Um, and a lot of times people ask, well, should I pray to God or should I pray to Jesus or should I pray to the Holy Spirit? Um, and and the, the truth is that really they're all God, so you could pray to any of them. Um, but the most, the most common way that Christians should and the, in a way that kind of helps us think about the Trinity in the right way is to pray to the Father in the name of and through the Son, by the power of and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? So we have the, the Spirit in us, who is, who is Christ in us, the Spirit of God in us, and He is giving us this desire to, to know our Father and to, and to have 
inspired and godly communication and relationship. And so, and then we only have access to the Father through Jesus, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. So it is being in Christ and Him in us that we have access to the Father. So we have to go, if we pray to the Father, we have to do it in the name of Jesus. We have to be in Him. Positionally in Him, we have to be born again with Him in us and us in Him so that we can be blameless and perfect and righteous and even go to the Father in that type of prayer. So I give a bunch of different uh, um scriptures that you can go through some of the ones um, John 1 1 through 3 and 14 look that up uh, Colossians 2 15 through 16 Ephesians 4 uh, 1 John 5 20 and um, you know and there's I give a bunch of other scriptures that show Jesus is both fully God and fully man the Holy Spirit is is the Spirit of God, the actual literal Spirit of God, the one and only Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, right? He's not a Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of God, of the living God. And, uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of script. I cite a whole, I cite a, a dozen or more, so I'm not going to list all those. So, um, and it's, it's important that we understand this uh, triune nature of God. Because when it says, you know, he, Jesus wouldn't have probably not identified as the Son prior to his incarnation as a man. He, you know, he, Scripture in John 1 says he is the Logos or the Word of God. He is the, the logic of God. He is the, um, the, the very essence and wisdom and character and representation of God who then became a man and when he took on human flesh he didn't lay aside his divinity right he didn't stop being God and then become a man he remained of the same divine essence as God and then added humanity to that so he became both fully God and fully man. Okay? He was both simultaneously. Um, okay, so sometimes there's accusations of, uh, you know, Christians invented the Trinity. You have, you know, it, people say it came up in, uh, you know, they invent, Constantine invented it, or it came at the Nicene Council, or. You know, the Roman Catholic Church invented it, you know, all this stuff. It's, it's all nonsense. The Trinity is trustworthy. It's true. It's ancient. It's biblical. It's the correct, orthodox, traditional Christian teaching. And everything that says it isn't, quite frankly, bluntly, is a lie of Satan. So reject it all. Yes, you need to believe in the Trinity. If the Trinity is not true, then there is no way, listen to me closely, if the Trinity is not true, there is no way logically to have one God and worship that one God alone, right? We looked at in the previous sections, God wants all of our worship. We can only worship the one God. And, and he says he alone is the only God in all of existence, in all places, in all times, right? He is eternal. Everything that was created was created for him and by him, okay? We have to worship that one God, worship him alone. We can't do that and worship Jesus as Lord without committing idolatry by worshiping something else that was created. It's impossible. We can't worship God alone and then worship Jesus as our Lord at the same time without contradicting those things unless Jesus is of the same essence as God, right? And this is why, this is why it is difficult. It's why it's difficult because those people who met Jesus and knew him needed to believe that in some mysterious way 
he was God. In some mysterious way, he was Lord. He was the one to whom they could be saved by, the one who could forgive their sins, right? Sin is an offense to God. It's breaking his law. And Jesus could forgive your sins on behalf of God, right? He can only do that if he is God, right? And so uh, a good scripture, another one that I will give you is God says, this is God in Isaiah 45, 23, to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue swear allegiance. Paul even quotes this verse in Romans 14, 11. So he had and knew and confirmed this truth that every knee shall bow and every tongue swear allegiance to Isaiah, to God, as, in, as noted in Isaiah 45, 23. But yet, in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, Paul writes, at the name of God? No. At the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? So we can only give our allegiance to God alone. And yet we can give our allegiance and bow our knee and worship Jesus as Lord. So we need to have the Trinity to be able to do these things. <laughs> All right. um, as far as whether or not the Trinity was invented by somebody, it, it started later on and it, it's not biblical. That's wrong. Um, the Trinity was actually defended by early church fathers, including Clement, the third bishop of Rome in AD 96, Justin Martyr, a great Christian writer in AD 155, Theophilus, the sixth bishop of Antioch in AD 168, and Tertullian, early church leader in AD 197. Um, I put all these in the book. You can get the references and go and research them. Um, if, you, if you want an easy way to do it, or there's the names, you can go and look it up yourself. Um, but it's, and those are just a few of the names, right? It's, it's on early in the second century. And you say, well, what about in the first century? Well, we got the Bible for that, all right? So, you know, when they say, well, the, the Trinity is difficult, you know, God is one, how can he be one and three, right? They want to make God simple. They want to make him easier to understand and more like us. This is, this is the error of the false religions and the cults. In fact, if you trace through the entire Bible, that's, that's what all of the idolatry is, right? We want, we want a king just like us. We want a God just like us, right? We want one that is simple and easy to understand, even if it's something weird like a God with a bird head or has wings or whatever, right? We, we want something simple. And, and really, so they take God and they make him more like us, right? There's only there's one God and just that, he's just one, just one, right? This is what, what Muslims would say and Jehovah's Witnesses and Oneness Pentecostals and these other groups, but they ignore everything that God says about himself in, in scripture, right? So there is, but it's, it's not to us to, it's not up to us to go and simplify God and make him easier to comprehend so he's more like us and easier to understand, right? We take the scriptures, which are the highest authority, and we exegete them or we pull out of them the truths revealed by God to us, and then we submit to what God has said about himself, right? When Jesus said, you know, me and the Father are one, right? That we, we, we say, okay, that's what Jesus said, right? And there's only, there's only one God. And, and there's only one who comes from God. And there's only one by which we can be saved, the name Jesus. So it is, it is our duty to submit to what the Word of God reveals to us not 
tweak the Word of God so that it's easier for our digestion and easier to deal with and make everybody get along. No. God revealed who He is and we submit to that. And we submit to that. Um, a, a great, a great uh, passage that I love, I quote the whole thing, the whole thing in full on page 15, is uh, Romans 8, 9 through 11, because the entire Trinity is revealed, and it, it also captures the relational aspect of God's nature, which is really, which is really one of the more important parts about understanding the doctrine of the Trinity as we start to, to ramp up and get further into what it, why did God create all this? What's the purpose of everything? Why does, why does anything exist? Why does God set this, this entire stage with, with one good destination and one bad destination? Why does he present these, these, this entire matrix of reality for us? Why did he create personal beings to connect with? It all comes back to God is relational in his very nature. It's who God is. He is, God wasn't just lonely or in a lone isolated being and then he decides I'm gonna create beings right I'm gonna create some angels I'm gonna create some humans and some planets and everything else no he he is relational and he had eternal relationship within his own nature for all of eternity Bef before he made intelligent beings to relate to he still had relationship it's part of who he is so we need to realize that and realize that that God is relational. It's why He extends this opportunity for us to have an eternal life with Him, right? He's inviting, he's inviting us into that eternal relationship. So all of this is, at the end of the day, it's designed to teach us about who He is so that those of us who love Him and who are called according to this eternal purpose can share in it with Him. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, beautiful um, opportunity. And we're going to get more into that in the next section. But first, let me uh, just go and, and go through uh, Romans 8 and 9. So remember, uh, the, the, the scripture uh, teaches that we must be born again, born of the Holy Spirit. Um, that happens by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God and through repentance and faith in Him and what He accomplished on the cross that we can be born again and receive eternal life and re reconciled to God. So it says, You, however, are controlled not by the flesh, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, right? The Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, no, the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So we see the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ being equated. The Spirit of God lives in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So we see, we need to have the Spirit of Christ in us, which is the Spirit of God. And also, we belong to Christ if this happens. If this happens, then we belong to Christ already. Verse 10, but if Christ is in you, so if the Spirit of God is in us, then Christ is also in us. If Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, right? The, the fallen uh, physical nature or sinful nature, that part's still dead. However, it says, yet your spirit is alive. The spiritual nature of a person is alive because of righteousness. We now have Christ's righteousness living in us. He's in us and we're in him. Verse 11. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, right? Who's, who's the one who raised Jesus from the dead? 
right? God did. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. So if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, right? So again, we see the, now we see the Father also in you in some mysterious way. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. You see, we have the whole entire Trinity being revealed in this passage in multiple complex ways. All right, so it's, this is profound. The Spirit of God is also called the Spirit of Christ, and he's also called the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. And yet we know from other scriptures later that the Spirit in us is the Holy Spirit. So, obviously, who lives in us technically, as best revealed by the scriptures, is the Holy Spirit. But, in a mystical sense, His presence in us is also the Spirit of Christ in us and the Spirit of the Father in us. Right? So, technically, the Holy Spirit is in us, but because of the oneness of God, we, you don't receive the Holy Spirit without also having Jesus or the Father. Okay? They are one. And if he is in us, then we are in Christ, and Christ is in the Father. Okay? And because of all of this, the new birth is essential. You must be born again. And we will get, we'll go in deeper into that in a later section in this chapter. But you must be born again, and that happens by faith and trust in Jesus alone and in what he accomplished on the cross on your behalf. And then he invites us into this eternal relationship. So until next week, uh, make sure to uh, hit like, subscribe, and hit the notification button. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. God bless. Have a great and empowered week.